Welcome to the Future of Education podcast. Here's our host, the co-founder of Two Hour Learning, Mackenzie Price. Welcome to the Future of Education podcast. I'm your host, Mackenzie Price, and today we're going to discuss the basis models transformation of charter school education. Charter schools are really doing a great job in our country. They are well, well needed service uh, in our education environment. And I'm super excited that joining us is Peter Bazanson. He's the co-chairman and CEO at Basis Educational Ventures. And Basis Educational Ventures is committed to fostering a transformative educational environment that nurtures intellectual curiosity, academic excellence, and interdisciplinary collaboration. As the parent company of Basis Educational Group, it manages the Basis Charter Schools and Schools for Advanced Studies Networks. And today, Peter and I are going to discuss how the Basis model is revolutionizing education. So here's my conversation with Peter Bazanson. Peter, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited to get to speak with you. Thanks, Mackenzie. Looking forward to it. Yeah. So, you know, some people may not have heard about basis schools. And uh, honestly, if they haven't, they're maybe in some ways kind of living under a rock because basis has really taken the country by storm. Can you just start out by giving us an overview of, of what basis charter schools are? Sure. Yeah, we were started in 1998 um, as a single school in Tucson. Um, the founders of basis were looking for a school for their daughter and discovered the educational wasteland that was Tucson, Arizona at the time. And brand new charter law went into went into effect in, in Arizona in the early in the mid 90s. So in 1998, they opened basis Tucson. And from from there, we've grown to operate 40 charter schools in Arizona, Texas, Louisiana, and Washington, DC. So from humble beginnings, came this pretty large network of schools relative to some of our peers. We're certainly in the in the conversation when it comes to the to the largest charter school networks in the country, we are pretty proud of the fact that we are definitely the highest performing charter network in the country. When you're looking at state assessment results, uh, we're the number one school district in Texas, for example, the basis charter schools are, and routinely in the, in the top 10, top 15, top 20, all of our high schools in the U.S. News World Ranking uh, Report, which is a World Ranking Report of Public High Schools, which is based upon, largely based upon AP results. Yeah, I have seen that uh, list and it's pretty amazing because you'll you'll see the list of high schools that are the best and it's basis, 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 you know, kind of covering that. You guys have absolutely kind of gotten a monopoly on uh, high performance. What's the secret? How do you do this? Well, I think the biggest secret to it is that we knew what we wanted to do in high school. We knew we wanted to prepare students to perform at high levels when they went to college and that they could get into grad school. Like that's, we wanted to be the top performing high school. So our secret was not t- trying to take those kids in ninth grade, but instead building out a middle school curriculum that was rigorous, that began with introducing high stakes examinations in the middle school, um, above grade level work in math and science and humanities in the middle school. And also a pretty complicated schedule of classes and multitude of teachers. And so students in the middle school were really forced to confront the complexity of education, confronting it and then dealing with the stress of it. That then allows them to really be at the same level as most students are performing in high school at the middle school level and at the same level as most schools, most students are performing in college at the high school level. So I'll dig into that a little bit more with an example. So all of our students take two AP sciences in high school. Most of them take AP bio in 10th grade. The way that we kind of hacked the system and guaranteed that every student, we have no admissions criteria, no tuition, no barriers to entry, that every kid can pass AP bio and AP chemistry is that we divide those courses into two years. So you start with honors bio in ninth grade, and then you go into AP bio in 10th grade. So we basically stretch the AP curriculum over two years, making it almost impossible with two years of work that anybody couldn't perform and pass with, and most of our kids pass with fours and fives, pass with fours and fives. In the middle school, instead of just doing bio as part of a generalized science curriculum, which we think is a stupid way of teaching science, Students take sixth grade biology for three days a week, seventh grade biology for three days a week, eighth grade biology for three days a week. They also teach take three days a week of 
chemistry and three days a week of physics in all three years. So we divide out and teach discrete chemistry, physics, and biology every year in the middle school. So by the time you get to taking that AP exam in biology in 10th grade, you've effectively had five years of high school level bio. So creating this, the real big secret for us was creating a middle school curriculum that could prepare kids for high school. And then once we went down to primary school, it was an interesting thing because we really, when we built out middle school, we ramped it up. We introduced high stakes examinations where kids have to pass comprehensive exams at every grade level in order to get to move on to the next grade level, stuff like that, um, that made middle school feel like high school. We also wanted to make primary school feel like middle school, but we didn't want to create stress and we didn't want to create high stakes examinations. So we really went big in developing kind of a discovery-based, exciting, fun, spirited primary school curriculum. But what we do that most primary schools don't do is we have subject expert teachers in those classes. So a second grade kid has math from a math teacher and then goes to a science room where they have a science teacher, goes to a humanities room where they have a history teacher, goes to a Mandarin room where they have a Mandarin teacher. The traditional primary school is you have a homeroom teacher and they teach everything except for maybe the specials. But at basis, the primary, the, there is no homeroom teacher. There's no homeroom. The kids move from class to class and they have different teachers that are subject experts in those fields. Yeah. So your kids really are getting the experience of moving into middle school as you know young children, right? Your second graders are moving around into different classes and having that as a teaching thing. That's right. Now, one of the things you mentioned is that you don't have admissions criteria and you uh, offer basically either free or reduced tuition depending on the state. Am I correct about that? No tuition. So none of all of our schools are public charter schools. So uh, no tuition whatsoever and, and no admissions criteria. Wow. But what we will do occasionally is when a student applies to us for eighth or ninth grade, we will sit with them with sometimes give a readiness test, sit with the parents and the kids and say, look, we're a grade level or two grade levels above the norm. And you're trying to come in in eighth grade and you've been struggling at a traditional in a traditional seventh grade. So for you to struggle in a traditional seventh grade at a, at a district school or another charter school and then try to come into our eighth grade, it's like trying to come into a ninth or tenth grade. It's not going to work very well. If you want to do it, go for it. However, we would recommend that you repeat the seventh grade. So we will sometimes do things like that with students, but ultimately no, no admissions criteria. Wow, that's amazing. And so what type of families do you find are attracted to your basis schools? I'd say we have two kind of core demographics that are kind of in conflict with one another, which it allows for really interesting, diverse schools. So we have families who are looking for the most rigorous, most challenging, and ultimately most results-oriented schools for their kids. These tend to be, or often are, not universally, but tend to be first, second generation American families. In Texas, a lot of those families come uh, from India in Austin into the tech community. In San Antonio, there's a lot of families from Mexico City. And these are families that are looking for the sort of education that they had as kids in a country very far away from the United States that takes education more seriously than is taken in our country. Mm -hmm. So they, they're looking for the most rigorous curriculum. So we have those, we have that demographic of kids. And that's a lot of our students. Grafted onto that are students who have really struggled in a more traditional school model. And the parents believe that if they were in a basis school, that the basis school would have this magical impact on them. And they maybe they weren't taking their studies seriously. And now surrounding them with other kids who are taking studies seriously, that will have this magical impact. And it often does. I mean, it really does work. So they believe the culture of the school will raise their kid up. That's right. Um, and so sometimes when kids are struggling in the traditional environment, it's like, well, they're struggling, but it's because they just need to have a more rigorous environment and they need to be called to something greater. And do you notice a difference in how those kids do? You said it does generally work well? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, it can go both ways. I mean, it's a lot of work to come in when you're in that particular group where you've gotten behind because in a traditional setting and have failed to achieve at high levels in a traditional setting, it's going to be a lot of work to come into an advanced curriculum like ours. And so it can cut both ways. And I we see students who try to transfer in in that situation leave pretty quickly uh, because they're just not they're not willing to put forth that work or they realize how much 
it's going to take and it's just too much. Is it an up or out model or do you do you push kids out or they're I mean they're able to go? How does that work? Certainly we don't push kids out. We offer a whole lot of um, support in our system. So I mean my own kids went through the system and without naming names of you know if both of my kids have been on student support at one time or another. So they've both gotten below a C in a class or trending to be below a C in a class. And as a result, you know, they're spending extra time at lunch with the dean. Um, they're going after for mandatory after school tutoring. Um, so there's a lot of those supports in the system for students. We will, although we don't have a personalized model. I mean, every kid in sixth grade is either in algebra one or algebra two. To, or I'm sorry, is in pre-algebra or algebra one or algebra two. A couple are, are even in pre-calc, but there's no algebra-based course for math in high school. Our entry level, our lowest math course is pre-calculus in high school. And most of our kids in ninth grade are in either pre-calculus or calculus AB. A lot are in calculus, AP calculus in ninth grade. Well, it sounds like, so you're, you know, the earlier the kids go into basis, the faster they're on this quick track. That's right. You had mentioned if you come in in middle school and you're already kind of far behind, it's really hard to jump on that speeding train because your kids really are working one, two, even three years ahead. And by the time they get to high school, they're definitely going to be on an advanced math track as an example. But I like what you said about how if a student's struggling, it sounds like basis is really quick to identify like, uh oh, we got a challenge and let's get in there and support them to help get them back on track, uh, probably a lot faster. It sounds like you guys are able to just be a lot more reactive and proactive in, uh, in helping those students. Yeah, we give a lot of, we do a lot. I mean, we play off of the negative things that people say about basis and then I can pivot that into why it's positive. I mean, what people say about basis that where they, where they decide it's not the right fit for their, their students, or they think that it's, you know, not, not the best model for education is that it's too test heavy. We do test a lot. I mean, every Friday there's a math test. We do a lot of tests that are common across the network. So we're able to compare test results from one school to another and from one kid in one class to a kid in the other class. So there is a lot of testing and that prepares kids for those high stakes tests that they're going to experience in high school. But on the other hand, what it does is it gives us all of this data that we have to work with. So since we're testing kids at a young age, often during the school year, we're able to see where they are and where the where we need to put resources um, into their educational improvement. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of testing. And I think standardized testing gets this bad rap in the alternative education universe. And that's one place where our schools are very different, because testing provides data, and it provides us with the ability to understand what does a student know, where do they need help, where are they, where are they needing extra support, or where can they go even, even farther. And I also think the other benefit is that when you do get kids used to testing, at least our approach, I don't know how basis does it, but is very much a like, hey, testing is just part of the process. It's no big deal. Don't worry about it. It's like treat it as a normal thing. And I think that can be really helpful when they get into high school, when they get into college and beyond. One thing I'll say, I mean, I hear so much great stuff about basis and especially just it's a very academically rigorous environment that, uh, as you mentioned, you know, you're seeing great results. Your AP scores are great. Your college um, readiness is great. I will say, though, you know, the one thing I've heard and I've, I've talked to some of your students, I do interviews for Stanford University and I, I interview with basis students. And um, the one thing I'll say is they sometimes can come across as a little burnt out, yeah. right? They're, it's like so rigorous. And so I'm curious, is that is that a common issue? I'm just doing this very anecdotally, but is it a common challenge? And what is BASIS either doing or how are they trying to trying to help that? Or is it sort of just a, hey, this is a the high pressure type of environment? You either swim or, or move on. I think that's a great question. We've done analysis on our college persistence rate because where... There's the, every kid gets burnt out at some point or tired of high school. And I mean, the natural, the natural kind of trend line in high school is that for any student at any high school, probably, or at least at the ones I've, I've worked at or taught at is that it starts kind of a downward slide, maybe in your junior year that continues through your college application process. And then magically, like the second semester of your senior year, everything is amazing again, like you rekindle the relationships, you're friends with everybody. Like you, there are all these cool events like senior dinners and senior trips and stuff like that. So our problem is the same as every high school problems in a sense, I, but we, it's worse for us. Our most difficult years for sure are eighth grade 
and junior year. Like those two years are hard. Eighth grade is a very hard year for us. And then the, that junior year is a really hard year. And so I think what helps is the burnout that happens happens in your sophomore and junior year. And then what we've heard from our, uh, from our seniors when we, when we interview them at the end of their senior year is that the senior year really is therapeutic. For us, they do a senior, most of our students do a senior project. They're in capstone courses um, that have been created by the faculty um, that are very specific, you know, like the philosophy of Homer Simpson or something, you know, really interesting, quirky courses yeah, or really high level courses like organic chemistry or, you know, game theory or something like that. So very specific courses that students can dig into. Um, so the courses are fun. The senior projects fun. A lot of our kids travel, travel internationally for their senior projects. And so that senior year gives them a little bit of a break and a pre- an intellectual preparation and cultural preparation in order to go into college. So what we found is that I agree the burnout exists. It tends to exist not in the senior year, but in the year right before that. And then our college persistence rate is in, as measured by a lot of funders want you to measure college persistence. And they, the, the way it gets measured in the business, at least the, the funders that we're working with, is they want to look at what percentage of your kids go to college. And 100% of our kids go to college. Some take a gap year, but very few. But what percentage persists from their freshman year through their sophomore year? After the sophomore year, you can't really, at the high school, you can't really be held accountable for what happens in a student's junior year in college. But the persistence from freshman year to sophomore year is something that can be connected to their high school experience. And our high school persistence rate is, I think, 98% uh, our college persistence rate of freshman to sophomore year. And the number of students who don't persist, I mean, it's like one or two kids every couple of years. So our students go off into college and do really, really well. Yeah, that's amazing. So whatever that burnout, whatever happens, I agree it's a problem. I can see it in my own students that have graduated as well as when I go and visit junior and senior classes. That works itself through the system um, before they get to college. And, and you know, I think it's, it's true what you say. The, here's the bottom line in our education system. High school can be a challenging time, right? And especially junior year, fall semester of senior year. I've got a daughter who's um, second semester senior. She's found out she's getting into college. She knows where she's going. And, you know, when her school started the other day, I was like, congratulations, you're in the like second semester senior year. Enjoy it. Have fun. And I think that's true everywhere. Well, Peter, it's amazing what Basis is doing. And I think a lot of parents need to understand that there are options. There's so many parents that are frustrated with the, you know, traditional public school system. And the charter system is really incredible. And specifically, what Basis is doing, the results you're getting, the experience that these kids are getting is really incredible. So I want people to check this out. And what we're going to do is we're going to spend some more time tomorrow talking about charter schools in general. But I appreciate you joining us. And that wraps up this episode. I want to thank him again. He's the CEO and chairman of Basis Educational Ventures. Tomorrow, we are going to talk more about charter schools in general and the challenges and the triumphs that they have. Uh, If you can't wait until our next episode and you want to hear more about Peter, you can go find a link to his LinkedIn profile in our show notes. You can contact Peter on Twitter, where his handle is at F-R-E-G-E-5, or you can go check out the website basised.ventures. One link in our show notes I want to tell you about, you can head over to futureofeducationpod.com. We have summaries of all of our episodes and contact information for our guests. And of course, you can always reach out to me on social media. My handle is future of underscore education. You can find me on Instagram. If you haven't subscribed yet and you want to, go ahead and hit that button. That's all for today. Until next time, remember, kids are limitless. Our job is to help unlock their potential. 